<laughs> okay, so where'd that book go? It's on the desk, the chair. No, 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 my World War II book. Yeah. Oh, here's it. Okay, so today we are going to talk about the end of the war. Okay, uh, ladies, uh, you're watching this uh, recorded. Um, when I get back on Wednesday, um, I'm going to wrap up a few things, and um, Lily's going to do her presentation. So won't have a lot on Wednesday. So you know what this means, everybody. Cast Friday over this module. Okay. So, um, here we go. All right, so we talked uh, the other day about the island hopping across the Pacific. I spoke to Iwo Jima. Uh, Joseph spoke about um, Okinawa and uh, Peleliu, okay? Um, and so, as we move closer and closer, we're taking these island chains. And by taking these islands, guys, we now have airstrips that can reach Japan. Yes? So we will begin bombing of Japan with the B-50, excuse me, the B-29 bombers, okay, which are the pressurized ones, the big one there in the middle of the poster at the bottom, one that we have in Wichita today called DOC, okay? Now, DOC is an interesting story if you don't know behind it. Most of these B-29s, B-17s, these bombers and planes from World War II, they wind up in a boneyard. Uh, out in New Mexico, where there's just all these old planes rotting, okay? They call it a boneyard. And um, somebody had the idea locally that since there were no B-29s flying, we do have some B-17s and 25s that are operated to this day, but we didn't have any B-29s. So they started the operation to rebuild one. Each engine on the B-29, okay, took $100,000 just to rebuild the engines. And then you had to have people that knew how to do this that actually built it the first time. And so a lot of the old veterans of Boeing that worked in Wichita on these airplanes came back and helped with the effort to get DOC airworthy again, okay, which is kind of neat. So now it travels to different air shows around the country. And uh, if you keep your eye to the sky, You'll see it eventually flying over Wichita, if you haven't already. Everybody seen it? Flying over? Yeah. It's very noticeable. Okay. Yeah, it's got a different sound to it. Okay. So this last slide here uh, with notes on it uh, discusses the building of the atomic bomb. Okay. And I've talked about this a little bit already, uh, but let's get into some more detail on it. Okay. So the idea of being able to split an atom, which for many years, guys, it was thought the atom itself was the smallest particle. And we know better today, right? Yes, you guys learn all about this in science, okay? Um, many thought it was unbreakable because it was so small. Um, but some people like Einstein and Enrico Fermi, an Italian physicist, believed it was possible. And so they went to work trying to do it. In fact, the first ever to split an atom was this guy, Enrico Fermi. Does anybody know where he did it? Not in Italy. Columbia. Is this the one on the college campus? University of Chicago. Underneath the football field in a laboratory. Under, it was underground. He split an atom. Now, this atom did not have any kind of like crazy chain reaction. So the other day we were talking about, remember we were talking about the difference between fusion and fission bombs, yes? So Lily went home that night and did a bunch of research on it. She said, I think I can explain it. So she's going to make that part of her presentation on Wednesday. Okay. Um, so I, I don't think I'll steal too much of her. Uh, stuff, but uh, okay. So the bomb itself, guys. The project to build it, of course, is called the Manhattan Project. Okay, and so when I was texting back and forth with my brother-in-law, Lily's uncle, um, he went to Rice University for his undergrad in engineering, 
And he said the president of Rice University, at the time a guy named Hackerman, was on the Manhattan Project, okay? And when my wife was at Virginia Tech getting her chemical engineering degree, one of her professors was also working on the Manhattan Project. Okay, so they took the brightest minds in the United States that they could find. Mathematicians, engineers, physicists, okay? And basically, you're, you're sitting at home one day, and there's a knock on your door. And you open the door, and there's two guys dressed in black, you know, men in black. And they're from the government. And they tell these scientists and mathematicians, look, your nation needs you. We can't tell you what you're going to be working on, how long it will take, but you can take your family with you. Will you volunteer for this? And that's how they got these scientists together. Okay. And that's how Will Smith. Yes. This is a group of uh, the scientists pictured here. Down here. Okay. Uh, here's some of the names. Okay. Now, this isn't everybody. Uh, but J. Robert Oppenheimer is the lead scientist. So you think there's any egos in this room? Yeah, there's a few egos. They all think they're the smartest guy in the room. So Oppenheimer has to corral these guys and get them to work together. Okay. So uh, Thomas Crenshaw, Oppenheimer, Lawrence Early, uh, Ernest O. Lawrence, James Comment, Layman Briggs, uh, E.B. Murphy, uh, Arthur Compton, Robert Thornton, K.D. Nichols. Okay, there were a lot of other ones. Yes. This is later. That's later. Um, now, some of these might be of German ancestry, but uh, they're they live in the United States. All of these guys lived in the United States at the time. Okay. Um, now, guys. Been in here the whole semester, yes? And back here, there's a letter. Have any of you guys read this? It's from, yes, it's from Albert Einstein to President Roosevelt. It's dated August 2nd, 1939. Okay? And in this letter, Einstein explains to Roosevelt that splitting an atom is something that many scientists are thinking can happen and it can be used to create a weapon okay the lead atomic scientist i told you the story the other day for the germans was say my name uh, Walter. <laughs> no. heisenberg <laughs> heisenberg okay yes you were getting that walter white yes and uh so this is something that roosevelt will take seriously okay and they will establish the Manhattan Project in May of 1942. They're going to do this outside of Los Alamos, New Mexico, in the desert. Okay, now, if you, if you study this a little bit more, understand the Manhattan Project uh, had locations all over the country that were working on different parts of this. Okay, but the main uh, operation was outside of Los Alamos. Okay, now... Two billion dollars was spent on this. Okay, uh, this is why you know in the budget for the military you have things that are very expensive when the military buys them, like toilet seats that would normally cost you thirty dollars. Pentagon puts in the budget a hundred dollars. You need nuts and bolts. Yes. Well, those are pretty cheap, but for the Pentagon to buy them, they're expensive. And so all this money that is excess cost usually goes towards research for top secret projects. You've all heard of Area 51, okay, which is where they tested the stealth bomber and the stealth fighter. That's where they did all the secret testing of out there at Area 51, okay, it's top secret location. You're not allowed to go there. You're supposed to go there. Okay. Now, so this is uh, Area 51 is out in New Mexico, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Nevada. Okay. That's right by Los Angeles. Yeah. 
Las Vegas. Yes. So um, the first bomb is detonated on July 16, 1945. This is a time lapse photograph of that first bomb, uh, which had a nickname Trinity. Okay. Um, now, Truman was actually at the Potsdam conference with Stalin and Churchill. Now, this conference, which is after Yalta, okay, um, Churchill is at this conference and then loses in parliamentary elections back in London. And so he gets a telegram while he's at this conference with Truman and Stalin that he's been defeated and he needs to return home. His replacement, I believe was Benjamin Disraeli, was coming to take his spot, which is really embarrassing for Churchill, as you can imagine. They just won the war in Europe, and the British Parliament saw fit that, hey, we don't need Churchill anymore. Lost his job. Now, they bring him back in 1951. He would become prime minister again. Okay. But I'll tell that story because Truman feels really bad for him because, you know, it's embarrassing. Um, and Truman later is going to invite him to the, to the United States, in which he'll give a very important speech, one of the most important speeches of the 20th century, he will give in Missouri, doing a commencement address at Westminster College in Missouri, where Truman is from. Okay. You may have heard of it before. It's called the Iron Curtain speech. Okay. Churchill will do that uh, in Missouri. Okay. Now, on the now, while Truman's at the conference, he finds out this bomb works. So Truman's thinking to himself, I may have the winning weapon. Okay, because as we take these islands, guys, we lost 12,000 men on Okinawa, 8,000 men on on Iwo Jima, the worst battle in the history of the United States Marine Corps. Okay, that's 20,000 men on these two islands. So they start trying to figure out how many people are gonna die taking the main island of Japan. And so Truman is immediately pepped up. Does he tell Stalin or Benjamin Disraeli about this bomb? No. But you know what? Stalin knows it worked. Because he has two spies working on the Manhattan Project. Okay? So, even though Truman doesn't tell him, Stalin knows. Now, do you think that builds trust between the United States and the Soviet Union or creates distrust? Yeah, for sure. If Stalin knows and Truman doesn't tell him. So, like, Stalin's like, I don't know if I can trust this Truman guy. Well, Truman should certainly be thinking that about Stalin. Yes? Now, we warned the Japanese. Now, I got to tell you something, guys. We have been bombing Japan by this time with great frequency, with conventional bombs and incendiary bombs from the B-29. Okay? In reality, guys, more Japanese will die from conventional bombing than from the atomic bomb. Now, the number is extremely high for both, okay? But we are firebombing their cities, including Tokyo. So anytime we bomb their cities, guys, we drop leaflets ahead of time. And we tell the Japanese to leave the cities before we bomb them to limit civilian deaths, okay? Truman warns the Japanese on the 26th, if you do not surrender, you will face lightning from the sky on which the earth is never seen. Okay? No surrender from the Japanese. Okay? And as Cohen will tell you, guys, the Japanese had a lot of American prisoners of war on the island of Japan. Okay, so our prisoners, they talk about this in the book, can see the B-29s flying over. So they know something good has happened. These are American bombers flying over Japan. They don't know if we're winning or losing the war. 
They're prisoners of war, you understand? And the Japanese gave a kill order to kill all prisoners of war. Thank goodness they did not carry that out. Okay. But there was an order given to kill all the prisoners. <coughs> all right. So, on August 6th, the first target will be Hiroshima. Okay. Or Hiroshima, however you prefer to say it. Okay. Three days later, the second bomb will be dropped on Nagasaki. These are both industrial cities that are war machine making cities. Okay. If we were going for the number to kill just people, we would have bombed Tokyo with the atomic bomb or Kobe, which is another large city. Question? Uh, is the third target that day. I saw a really good special on the Weather Channel. They, <laughs> I know. They do. They have um, how weather changed history. Okay, so the, on the 9th, the bomber was called Boxcar. The first bomber that dropped the first bomb was called Enola Gay, named after uh, the Tibbet. Tibbets was the pilot. His mother was Enola. Enola Gay, that was her name. So he named the plane after his mom. The second bomber, B-29, was Boxcar. And it left off and it had a target city, but there was cloud cover. So they went to the secondary target, cloud cover. They had just enough fuel to get the Nagasaki and back to the island of Tinian, which is where these bombers were taken off from. And um, there was a parting in the clouds so they could see their target, which was a bridge in the city center. Now, Nagasaki is in a valley. So when these bombs go off, Okay, they create an intense firestorm that goes out with hurricane-like force winds. Okay, then the bomb needs fuel; it needs oxygen, and so all that firestorm goes out, and then all that oxygen sweeps back in, creating the mushroom cloud. Following, okay, so. Um, I've got something I'm going to read to you here in just a second about what it did to these two cities, okay? Um, so the second bomb, and I did hear another, I saw another documentary about a guy that was in Hiroshima on the 6th, survived it, fled to Nagasaki, and was there when the second bomb hit and survived that. Yeah. That's, that's a really crazy story, okay? The Japanese will not surrender until the 14th okay, of August. Uh, and our bombing continued, conventional bombing in those days was winning. Okay. So let me just kind of read this. This is from my Time Life book here. Would they have used a third bomb? Um, from what my knowledge, we didn't have a third one ready yet. Okay, so the first bomb is a purely uranium bomb. Here's my mouse. Okay, so the first bomb is nicknamed Little Boy. Okay, that's what it looked like. It's pretty big. Um, and it was uranium. This one, uh, Fat Man, which was dropped on Nagasaki, was a plutonium bomb, which is made out of uranium and some other stuff. Okay, I'm not an expert on that. Okay. Um, this is the ceremony uh, at the end, okay? Um, and if we don't get to this uh, today, the video on this today, I'll show it on Wednesday, okay? Um, you see the Japanese, this is on the USS Zuri, which is famous from the movie Battleship. So the aliens come in, that's a great movie, the Battleship movie. And they take the Missouri off of mothballs, get the old guys to help, and they destroy the aliens. You guys all seen that? Yes. Dude, it's pretty good. I mean, it's, it's sci-fi, you know, but it's pretty good. They break out the Missouri, man. It's got 16-inch guns on it. It's pretty cool. Okay. All right, so let me read this, okay? 
Um, it was a force beyond previous comprehension of mankind. The atomic bombs of August of 45 reduced Hiroshima and Nagasaki from bustling centers of war industry to blackened wastelands. It seemed impossible, said one eyewitness, that such a scene could have been created by human means. The bombs left thousands of victims to die slow, agonizing deaths. A thousand more it had been more merciful. They had died in the blinking of an eye so quickly that perhaps being a, unaware of dying. You just vaporized. Okay. If you were near the epicenter, you just, I mean, in a flash, you were gone. In an effort to calculate the dimensions of the bomb's power, a group of Japanese scientists probed through the ruins for days afterward. They discovered that air bursts had produced pressures that matched the sustained thrust of a tidal wave, knocking down all but the strongest buildings of concrete and steel. Heat measured in the thousands of degrees Fahrenheit and traveling at the speed of light had set fire to wooden structures that were more than a mile from ground zero. The hypocenter above which each bomb exploded. At twice the distance, infrared rays had charred telephone poles and burned human skin. And in Hiroshima, the thermal wave swept out over the city, setting alight homes in its path into a vacuum created by its passing roared hurricane-like winds, fanning a fire storm that raged for hours. In all, 62,000 of Hiroshima's 90,000 buildings were destroyed. In Nagasaki, the hills separating its industrial quarter from the rest of the city blocked the thermal wave, so no firestorm followed. Even so, the wave of heat instantly ignited wooden buildings within two miles of the hypocenter, and 11,500 of the city's 52,000 residents burned to the ground. Exactly how many people died in the Hiroshima as a direct result of the atomic bomb has never been determined with strict accuracy. Initial figures placed the dead at 68,670. Wounded at 72,800. They later rest the death, raised the death count to 140,000 in Hiroshima. Nagasaki, the plutonium bomb, proved a reaper not so lethal as the predecessor. 37,500 died, 26,007 wounded. They later raised that number to 70,000 dead. So between the two, about 210,000 people. But the terror of the bombs extended well beyond the casualty list of the times. In the years and even decades that followed the appearance of the mushroom cloud, latent radiation chose new victims at random and with little warning. Indeed, for a time, there was a rumor that the Americans had seeded their devilish bombs with some virulent germ or lingering poisonous gas. As hundreds of seemingly healthy people became an ill and died with symptoms of radiation sickness and, and from illnesses thought to be spawned by the radiation. People of Hiroshima and Nagasaki came to realize that none of them could be absolutely sure of having escaped the wrath of the nuclear explosion. Thus, the list of terrors introduced by the atomic bomb was added another, the terror of the unknown. Okay, so birth defects high cancer rates, and so forth, would be a byproduct of these, uh, of these bombs. Now, both of these cities are back um, in full population uh, and health and so forth, but for many years, those problems lingered for those people. Contamination of the soil, contamination of water sources, and so forth from the radi radiation from these bombs. Okay, so... Um, these are quite extraordinary weapons, guys. Now, the video I show you uh, either today, probably on Wednesday, will speak to the idea of how many Americans may have died had we had to take the island by, you know, by sea. Um, and, you know, the estimates are very wide ranging. So you had an estimated 210,000 Japanese dead from the bombs. 
the atomic bomb. More than that, from conventional bombs. And then, how many Americans would die? How many American casualties would there be? Some estimates went as high as one million American casualties to take the island of Japan. Okay, so we haven't really gotten into the depth of the ferocity of the Japanese. Joseph touched on it a little bit. I've got a lot more to show you on that, but I got to get Cohen in here. Okay, so ladies, uh, I'm going to cut the video here. We'll pick up Wednesday with a few more things and Lily's presentation. Bye.